Hey guys, this is Nick with What Game Now. We're back with part three in our Building a Better Army series. If you haven't checked them out yet, check out parts one and two. This is part three where we will begin discussing the concept of roles. So before we do that, we actually need to define one thing, and that is what I call an element. So when I build plans, when I, I, I play games, you have your army, it's built of units and models or what, whatever currency your, your game uses. But what you find is that groups of things tend to operate together. And I call those elements. And the definition I assign to that is a group of models or units that operate as one entity on the battlefield. Now, why do they operate as one entity? Well, usually one of two things. There either is a penalty, or maybe they're not even allowed to move away from a certain distance from each other. A good example with the 40K models we have pictured here are the squads. In 40k, an individual squad could be an element. A single model is not, because it's not free to move away from its fellows. But there are other reasons. In heavy gear, there is no squad coherency. Instead, you're advantaged to operating close to each other by the use of orders and things like that. So what you'll find is that elements are the things that as you're moving around, they'll stick together. Um, this could be a blob of characters. This could be a squad with a supporting element. This could just be a lone tank. It doesn't matter. But these are going to serve as the basis for our plans. I call them the tactical currency. This is We're going to be talking about elements doing things as we go on. And I'm going to stress this again. Elements must be able to operate separate from each other. Now, there's some interesting interactions with that. Um, he, um, I'm going to click on Warhammer for a moment here. The Astra Militarum Lehman Russ tank is completely capable of operating by itself, even though you can get three of them in a single detach in a single uh, slot on your army. They are three separate elements. Now, if you put a tank commander behind them and have them always moving around with the tank commander, now you have one element. So. Hopefully that makes some sense. When we go to the example, we'll, we'll go through more of this in some more detail. But now that we know what an element is, let's talk about roles. Roles are, to put it bluntly, the in-game things that elements do or are capable of doing. And in theory, a uh, philosophical point here, anything can do anything. Any element can do any anything. But we're going to specifically look at the things we tend to excel at. You know, does this unit hold objectives well? Does this unit do this or this? And one thing, as we, we're going to go through and talk about identifying elements in some examples, um, one thing about elements is that the more roles they can perform well, the less effectively they can do each one. Okay, so for example, if I have a unit that is, you know, capable of doing A and B, it's going to be worse on the whole than a unit that could just do A or just do B within those given roles. Now, when we're building our army, that might be important. We might need it. We might need a unit that has multi-role capability. We'll talk about that when we get there. But in general, units having multiple roles isn't a bad thing, but you do have to be careful. Um, and some factions build their entire premise on this. Prior to the presentation of Primaris Space Marines, I would contend that Space Marines were the army that was the slightly above average. Apologies there. All right, so let's talk about identifying these roles. So what I do when I look for a role, I'm going to look at a given element, and it's the element as a whole, not the pieces in the element. The element as a whole. What are its stats? What are its weapons? What are its abilities? abilities and I'm looking for patterns okay if I have an element and one part of that element has a really good melee we weapon that does not mean the element is good at melee what it means is it has you know the one guy has a melee weapon Woo. now if every guy has a strong melee weapon now that's an interesting question here now that that might be a role and I emphasize that with weapons with abilities for example, if I have an element and a lot of them have abilities that help them mitigate damage, that will be very important. That'll give us a clue as to what this element is good at. 
I'm also looking at just hard stats. And sometimes even in-game interactions. Um, I keep going back to the character blob, and I, and I like this as an example for an element because it was a friend of mine. He's playing 40k, he was playing Space Marines at the end of 8th edition. And he was using a character blob of Ultramarines. It was like five or four or five characters operating very tightly together. They basically were absurdly durable because A, they're characters, they have better stats. And B, there were some gameplay interactions that meant he basically controlled who you shot at. Okay, they all had strong melee weapons. And each of the pieces in it, you know, usually a couple pieces did a few things, so it had potential to do almost anything. Other questions I'm going to ask you, do they favor long-range weapons or short-range weapons? Do they have above-average defensive stats? Are they faster? These are the questions we want to ask ourselves to identify the role. And the role is what happens when we put these together on the battlefield. And I'm going to freely admit, this is the uh, this this requires a lot of I don't want to say a lot, but this requires some experience to know looking at a model that hey, this is an example of good durability. This is an example of good offense or whatever. It's going to take some practice. Okay, one thing I am always going to recommend is play test play test play test you have to play things you have to you have to you have to and you're going this is part of the reason why is because you need to test these things you need to try them you need to see i got this element i think it does this and then try it and maybe you'll find out that it's not actually a good fit for that anyway let's talk about some examples these are getting a little small. I got two more unlisted ones here that I'm going to throw on here, but we're going to go ahead and talk about some of these examples. One of the first things that's important with a role is roles are usually going to have some statement about distance. Okay, or there's some aspect of that distance is going to be important for engaging the enemy. Is this a long range unit? And by long range, I tend to refer to those are units that can shoot from one end, edge of the table to the other. Okay, so if you imagine two armies, if I put my unit on the very back table edge by my on my side, I should be able to hit your back table edge. I would qualify that as a long range unit. Okay, um, specifically from the shortest distance between the two is what I would characterize as long range. Medium range is anything from there up to the edges of the deployment zones. So essentially, if I can stand in my deployment zone and shoot into your deployment zone, for 40K and a lot of other games, I would qualify that as medium range. Um, I do want to point that you got to be careful with some of these definitions. Infinity, for example, this is meaningless because you can pretty much shoot across the table with nearly every gun in the game, or at least a good chunk of them. Whereas in War Machine, the longest range gun in the game is 20 inches. So we do have to be a little bit careful here. Um, but on the whole, we're looking at ranges. Um, short range is anything very close. I would qualify it also as melee would go in there. And then lastly, I would also define non-combat as portion of a role. And as we go down, you're going to go ahead and talk about a few of these. Uh, one of the roles I often use is what I call artillery. These are elements that have a strong but, um, group of long-range weapons. Oftentimes, these weapons will have indirect fire capability. You don't need line of sight. And these elements are, like I said, they're artillery. That's what I would call them. They're going to sit back. They're going to shoot across the table. Generally, artillery units tend to be a little bit on the frailer side or a little bit on the slower side usually not both, at least if it's a good artillery unit. And their weapons aren't necessarily incredibly powerful. They're in, it's the range here that's the key thing. Blitz, these are high speed elements that tend to favor short range weapons. So an example here is I would say assault marines in 40k would fall into this role. They're what I would call a blitz element, a high speed short range element. Uh, they don't carry long-range weapons, but they move fairly quickly. Roaches, 
Um, it, if you're comparing this to like multiplayer games, you would call this a tank. But since we're dealing with games that could potentially have tanks, and interestingly enough, not all tanks are the stereotypical tank, I call them roaches. This is stuff that's just, they're, they're, they excel at not dying. Very high durability per model of their class, um, typically at some cost. Um, and it's worth knowing that they typically don't have a lot of weapons, if any. These guys are, they're, they don't die, that's their point. Um, support, these are things that enhance the ability of fellow units. They actually are typically unarmed or very poorly armed for their uh, relative cost, but have a lot of abilities that rely on helping friendlies. So there's your support. Jammers, these are fast, durable elements that go out and basically disrupt your opponent. By not dying, they do more damage to their opponent than if they were making attacks. Uh, these are very commonly seen in War Machine and in games where there's a lot of order of operations. Simply putting something in your opponent's way forces them to deal with it. Denial elements. These are elements that prevent your opponent from doing something. Landing reinforcements, um, moving up a certain area, these a, a good ex and, and this can be a little bit different you can also talk about like area denial for example in heavy gear i would put say a gear with a shotgun you know particularly maybe it's got react plus or something like that in this area because it's a zone control element denying your opponent from coming into it okay i try to avoid the word control because it doesn't really exist in miniature games it's usually control through denial or threat, and that's actually something we'll talk about in a later video. Another category I tend to put out there is called output. That's just a, the name I give them. These are units that their role is output. They excel at doing damage. Range is kind of irrelevant. And it's worth noting that it's to the expense of all other things. Oftentimes, output units tend to not be the most durable in the world. If they are durable, fantastic. But they're all about killing things. A good example would be in Warhammer 40k, the Gladiator Reaper tank. I would classify as an output unit. Okay, it's got medium range capability. Not long, but medium range capability, and it's all about the damage. It does literally nothing else. It happens to not die a little bit hard, or not die as easily, and that's going to be reflected in its point cost. But that's what I would classify as an output unit. The two that I didn't list, uh, well, three. Um, you could throw melee on here as a role. Um, I would call them close combat units. These are units that are designed to specifically get into and make melee attacks. And they, like I said, they, they excel at making melee attacks. It doesn't, how fast they get there is not relevant to that discussion. That comes up later. Um, if you have a really fast unit that can get into melee, I would almost qualify that more as a blitz unit because you're going to see it used for different things. If it's also really durable, then maybe, maybe. Melee units do tend to favor some relative durability. Uh, maybe not necessarily per model, but per element. The element tends to not die quickly. Next up is, um, again, these are unlisted because I, I kind of ran out of room and I didn't want to keep making them smaller, is what I was referred to as the Death Star. So units with a Death Star role are absurdly powerful. Maybe not necessarily broken, but they're absurdly powerful because they take up a large chunk of your opponent's army. They're usually fairly quick, very durable, good output, but absurdly expensive. And the argument why it's called the Death Star is your opponent has to deal with it. There's no situation where they win the game without that unit having been taken care of or disabled. And then lastly, the uh, unit I would throw in there. So we have Death Stars, but I would also put um, what's referred to as a Distraction Carnifex. This date dates back to, I think it's 3rd edition 40k with Tyranids, and the idea of a Distraction Carnifex was a Carnifex, if you're not familiar in 40k, is a Tyranid monster that's big claim to fame. It's very cheap. It's very cheap. It's reasonably hard to kill. It will do, some, it will do a reasonable amount of damage. But it's one of those things that you put it in your opponent's way, and it's not necessary to you winning the game. A Death Star usually is. The Death Star is too big of an investment. But the Distraction Carnifex is a very small investment. So all of those you know, good durability, good output are all relative to a low cost. And your opponent simply has to deal with it. 
it's there to get in the way. It's there to encourage your opponent to attack it. Unlike the Death Star, its loss is not a significant issue. The Death Stars usually tend to be... Losing your Death Stars are really, really bad. So, this is kind of a little bit rambly, but hopefully this kind of walks you through a few ideas of what I, I consider to be different roles. You've got artillery, blitz, roaches, jammers, things like that. And then, hopefully you can take this and apply it to your army. Ask yourself. You know, pick up a unit and say, what does this unit do well? What kind of weapons do they have? Are their weapons good at fighting heavily armored targets or lightly armored targets? Do they have any key special abilities? Are they relatively fast? Do they have good damage output? Is it against only certain types of targets? All of these things are going to come in. Okay. And actually, that's a good one. That's one I missed. Um, just the idea of anti-tank. Um, anti-tank is a catch-all term I use for anything that's designed to fight heavily armored targets. Not necessarily tanks. Maybe they design to fight monsters, but they, they excel at fighting things that have a very, very high degree of individual durability. Like tanks. Um, they don't always do well with really durable units that are element-based. Like a squad of zombies is usually not a good thing for an anti-tank unit to fight. But they'll happily fight the tanks. Anyway, I'm digressing, guys. That's been Nick here with What Game Now, signing off. Hey, this is Dave. If you like what we're doing here at What Game Now, go ahead and click on one of the videos which should be on either side of me, or click right in the middle and go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to hit the bell once you subscribe so that you know when we have new videos. Please go ahead and share us with your friends. Let everybody know that we're here. Thank you for watching, and thank you for all of our subscribers already. And we look forward to bringing you more content every chance that we get.